I was wondering if I could ask you like a couple of questions. Like um, I've got three, maybe four questions. Okay. That maybe then we can actually cut up and just make available separately, you know, for guys to access if they want to. Sure. Uh, Daryl, thank you for that. Um, I actually preached a sermon to Rosebank uh, quite a few weeks back um, on the beginning of Ephesians chapter two. So particularly about the dividing wall of hostility. And um, just as you were talking about that now, I wanted to ask you a question just particularly around something that the world is grappling with. I'd say it's probably the second global concern. So we've got coronavirus and the second global concern is, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement. That's right. It's race. That, um, yeah, race. That, you know, we followed quite closely here, the George Floyd protests and... Um, I actually interrupted a preaching series to talk about that and other things a little bit. Um, and, and, you know, we're talking about that still now. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to ask if you could maybe just comment on that a little bit for us, like the, the importance of that conversation, where we maybe go wrong in that conversation and just like, you know, highlights for the church, because I think you're right. It's a particular opportunity we have in this realm to demonstrate this, you know, immeasurable power, but I just don't think we get it right. Often. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And uh, the reason, one of the reasons I like to preach that passage is because it, it does show the direct connection between what salvation is for and the work of reconciliation in the world that the church mm -hmm. is supposed to be the primary representative of. Um, you right. all in South Africa certainly have been through this and understand this conversation. In fact, you're probably ahead of us in, in this conversation in many ways. And the challenge here is that um, what the church has done is they've tended to separate the gospel from the social engagement part of which reconciliation is a part. And they've seen them as two detached concerns. In fact, as a result of what has been called the fundamentalist modernist controversy, those two things have been split apart. And the the bad guy in the room oftentimes is what is called the social gospel, okay? The idea of simply helping others and not talking about the gospel. Now, that is a problem, okay? Um, there's no doubt that's a problem. That's not the way to go about this. But having said that, what we did is we threw the baby out with the bathwater. So we said there's the gospel over here, okay, which is the message of salvation, and then there's how we relate to others over here. And that's a separate conversation that's not about this conversation over here. And I'm saying, no, 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 no. Read Ephesians. And in fact, is a case that how we treat others is a direct result and supposed to be a natural product of what salvation is supposed to be about. That's where it's supposed to take us. It's part of a restoration process action that God is engaged in that's designed to connect people, not just back to God, but to one another. And so the, the, God, the outreach that's involved with social engagement is, a, is detached to the product of the gospel. You can't separate them. And then I use a line that you normally hear in another context, which is what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Okay that you, these things belong connected. And it actually represents, as you've said, the church's outstanding opportunity to do something so different from the rest of the world that it will immediately stand out as being distinct and different and show that God's power is at work because it's so easy not to do this as we see every day. So, um, so yes, this is a very central theme. It's very important. The church that really understands the gospel shows that it understands the gospel by the way it engages. Okay. We tend to be consumed in the activities of the church and activities of worship and the activities of gathering together, but a church that really understands what God is about understands its mission. And when it understands its mission, it understands it, that it translates into action and it translates into action precisely in these kinds of areas. Why is it so hard? because we're inherently selfish. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's sin, and sin is inherently selfish. Sin inherently wants me to take control of my life and even do so at the expense of others. And that's what we see. 
Uh, and so unless that power of God is working in our lives to change the direction of the arrow, instead of being pointed at me, being pointed at others, this never happens. Right. Yeah, thank you, Daryl. I think um, in fact, the title of, of my sermon then was the, it's a line I borrowed from uh, Michael Eaton. I don't know if you knew of Michael Eaton. He was mm -hmm. a, yeah, so he called it the inevitable consequence of the gospel. You know, That's like right. The consequence of it, and it's inevitable. Like it should be happening. Um, like it's the point of it all in some ways. I mean, it's just in, you're right. It's an inevitable product, and that and that's why it's important to connect that salvation by grace through faith, and then ask, mm -hmm. so what is salvation for? Yeah, right. my sins are cleansed, and the Spirit comes in my life, so I live and relate to people differently as a result. A relationship with God has changed, but so is my relationship with others. You know what that translates into? The great commandment. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And if you look at the fruit of the Spirit, coming later in Ephesians, in fact, um, you will see that almost all those attributes of the fruit of the Spirit are relational. True. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I have a question just on something completely different. Um, so... I think I told you in the in the email. So we're doing this series through Ezra at the moment, um, and it mentions in, you know in chapter chapter one that you know God stirred the hearts of you know the exiles living in Babylon to go back home to Jerusalem and rebuild. And I'm just wondering, like, if guys are you know listening to this and it's Mission Sunday, you know, and you speak about these good works prepared beforehand. What advice would you give to somebody who's kind of sensing God? has prepared works of deliberate uh, kind of maybe missions activity or service, you know, vocationally in the kingdom somehow, what, how would you guard them? Okay. Well, this, this is an easy one. Okay. Because most people, when they come to a missions week say, okay, the church is asking me to go somewhere and share Christ. Okay. And when the somewhere comes up, they're saying, I'm not thinking about South Africa. I'm thinking about the Philippines or Korea or, you know, somewhere far, far away in a distant far land, you know, and you enter into the, you know, the Star Wars mission somewhere in a land far, <laughs> far away. This is going on. That's not the way to apply this. The way to apply this for most people is right where God has you. The mission field that you have are the relationships that exist around you, the way you do your work, the way you interact with the people you work with, the way you handle and engage with your family and neighbors and friends. That's the mission field. And so in, in the center, we talk a lot of what we call about faith and work because the workplace has been secularized in our minds and in our world. And so we tend to think I do my Sunday stuff and I'm spiritual. And then there's the rest of the week where I do the best I can, but there really is a disconnect. And the mm -hmm. emphasis, of course, is no, you take your Christian faith and who you are as a person and you apply that way of living to the way you engage with every space that God brings you into. And so that's where you see it apply. What can you, how can you extend a hand of invitation and of the presence of the opportunity for reconciliation to the people around you who you work, to the job that you do, to the way that you do it, all those kinds of things. That's, that's the application of this. So missions, missions week isn't simply a call to do something in a distant and foreign land, in a galaxy far, far away. No. It's what you do in your home and in your workspace. Um, it's, it's what you do in the very places and spaces where God has providentially put you to be his beacon, his representative, his ambassador, his citizen on earth in that space. Mm. Uh, one last question, or maybe, maybe two, um, but um, you mentioned, I think you're quite, when you're talking about the power that's available to us, um, he said, so power over ma the malevolent, malevolent forces of evil. Yeah, forces yeah. of evil. And it just made me think of a conversation I had just today, past a friend of mine um, who actually they have opened their churches, you know, in the, in the restrictions of 50 or less. But he was just telling me about uh, a congregation member that really they were just really upset and causing a great disturbance, um, saying that the church had. Uh, had demonstrated a lack of faith 
in this coronavirus. They should be just opening the doors and um, just trusting God and believing him. And, you know, and I've heard of that kind of all over the world. There's been these crazy things. Well, I think it's crazy. Um, I wanted to hear your take on that. You know, um, you're right. It's crazy. It's no different than Satan saying to Jesus, get on the edge of the temple and take a dive and God will protect you. Huh. It's yeah. no different than that. It is presuming on God's protection. God mm -hmm. wants us to think as and live as well as to trust him. And the way in which we do that is I don't walk into a room full of radiation and say, God, protect me. OK, that would be crazy. OK, I don't walk in a space full of virus without a mask or protection and say, God, protect me. That's presuming on God. That's forcing him to act. OK, mm -hmm. so when we don't act in good faith with the situation that exists around us. OK, I think we actually um, we actually it isn't that we're uh, that we're exercising a faith that's trusting God. We're actually presuming on God. It's the exact reverse of what's being argued. And that's problematic. We're supposed to care for our neighbor. I care. I should care whether I can make you sick. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, that's basic. Uh, and so if I have to wear a mask to make that happen, I'm going to put on a mask every time. Mm. And I hope you'll do the same for me. You know, this right. is reciprocal. That's what love, I care for. I don't tell a child, run in front of that car and God will protect you. Right. I mean, I know you mentioned the masks. I know that's a major point of controversy over there with you all, right? With churches and wearing masks right. and not. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, I mean, the fact that the masks have been politicized in our environment in which we're dealing with sickness and germs, to me, is an indication of how distorted our politics have become right hey maybe one last question daryl just a more theological one um you know i mentioned michael eden i remember listening to him a long time ago he spoke a lot about inheritance and the ephesians you know has that wonderful you know statement about you know our inheritance what would you say you know if you had to summarize the idea of the Christian in inheritance. What would how would you describe it? Well, I, it's it's pretty simple in some ways, and yet it's profound. And that is, it is the inheritance is the direct, complete, and total access to God in all that He gives. It's Ephesians one three to fourteen. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. You know, the word "every" is really a problematic word. It means everything that we need. You know, <laughs> I mean, there's uh, that is that is a bounty that's being talked about. And so the inheritance is I tell people that sometimes when we share the gospel, we mislead people about what the gospel is about. We share it in such a way that the basic message is if you believe God, you will avoid going to a very warm and hot place for a very long time. You know, mm -hmm. that salvation is about avoiding hell. Right. Okay? No, 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 no. Salvation is not about avoiding hell. I mean, you do avoid hell if you get saved, but it's not about avoiding hell. It's about gaining someone. Mm -hmm. It's about gaining access, unlimited access, not just to the living God, but to the power and enablement that he gives you to live life and to appreciate what life is supposed to be. That is, that is unlimited wisdom. That is unlimited understanding. That is getting properly connected to why you exist and who you're supposed to be. Those are rich inheritances and they never run out. You know, the bank account, the credit card that you have has no cap. <laughs> okay. Okay. Not bad. Not bad. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's great. Thank you, Daryl. Hey, I think that's a great place to, 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 to end this. Um, just, talking about that. I remember you speaking about that idea a little bit when you when you came and preached last time. So thank you. I think most people really underestimate what they have access to in their relationship with God. And so I constantly am preaching and, and talking and playing that note because I think the more you're aware of how vast it is of what it is available is available, the more you will pursue it because you'll never run out of the ability to pursue it. Right. Yeah. 
Hey, um, thank you, Daryl, for for your time with us. Um, for your time with us today, I really appreciate you um, being able to preach, albeit virtually. And I really hope that next year, this time, when you're on your South African loop, loop uh, that you'll be able to come in and uh, get to meet a lot of the people that you're speaking to this Sunday. Um, I'm looking forward to that possibility as well. Hopefully it'll, you know, we'll get over the hump and make this work. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, I wish you all all the best and uh, do stay safe there in South Africa. Thank you.